Hello, everyone. Welcome to the December Data and Performance Management Committee meeting. Uh, please enter your agency name into the chat box so we know who is participating. If possible, please um, plan to participate in the meeting however you can, whether that's calling in or just um, unmuting yourself and um, responding that way or, or typing into the chat box. That's all great. Um, we just want to hear from you as we work through um, the agenda today. So most of the meeting is going to be focused on changes to the h policies and procedures. So it's um, especially important to get your feedback on this now. Uh, what I'm sharing today is um, a draft that will eventually be going to the policies, procedures, and standards committee, as well as the COC board. Um, so you do have an opportunity to weigh in on these policies before they are finalized. So um, however you're able to participate is great, but um, please try to participate if you can. And then we'll also be going over the transitional housing project performance reports. So um, really quick before I get into the changes. Um, so as you all know that we do have an HMIS policies and procedures document um, and users when they first join HMIS should be reviewing that full document. And when they um, first log into HMIS and sign the user agreement, they acknowledge that they read and understand the policies and procedures. Um, so we are making some revisions to this document. And um, today I'll be focusing on those changes to kind of um, guide your feedback. We will also be sending out a draft of the full policies and procedures to the users so that you can review and provide feedback that way if needed. Um, and um, the background on how this came up early, earlier this year, the COC board asked us to develop a process for reviewing and updating the policies and procedures annually. And so, um, to do that, we requested um, HMIS agency administrators that wanted to participate in a working group to review the policies and procedures in detail and kind of guide these changes. So we did develop that group. That group has met um, maybe six times already. And uh, we've gone through all of the document, at least initially once, um, and so we are bringing you those changes today to get your feedback on as well. So the first um, section where there are changes is the key terms and acronyms section. So it's at the very beginning of the policies and procedures. And we added a bunch of definitions for um, terms that we thought would be helpful for HMIS users to know. So we included currently homeless definition, the different project type definitions, um, federal funding source definitions that weren't in there. Um, we also included the emergency tracking method definition since that's a, a term specific to HMIS, as well as the definition of the policies, procedures and standards committee and, the, and two of the reports that are submitted to HUD, the longitudinal systems analysis and the system performance measures. Um, so that's fairly straightforward since they are uh, HUD definitions. The one big change in this section is that um, for projects that are set up as other in HMIS, there is a specific HUD definition for other projects. Um, and that is not necessarily how all of the projects in HMIS have been set up in the past. So the group proposed that we work on aligning our other projects with the HUD um, definitions of the different project types. And so because of that, we will be reaching out to all of the agencies that have other projects set up in HMIS to talk through how that project functions, um, if the other project type is the correct project type for that project, or if maybe um, in some cases we think that there are projects that are serving 
that are functioning as both a rapid rehousing and a homeless prevention project. And so, for example, in those cases, those projects would need to be set up, separated out into two projects. So um, that is the, one of the proposals for the group. We will be reaching out to the agencies to talk about that and um, work through the, the next steps of getting those projects set up correctly in HMIS. Um, I wanted to pause for a moment, a moment before I move on in case anybody has any thoughts or feedback on, on this so far. All right, I'm not seeing anything. The next section that has um, changes is the participating agency requirements section. So I'm going to pull up that section so you can see it. Um, and I'll move this for myself. <laughs> All right, so the first change for the uh, participating requirements section is we are proposing to increase the HMIS user fees that were established last year by the COC board. The reason for this is um, there have been many new agencies and new users added in the previous year, uh, as well as a cost increase from BitFocus to our contract with them. And so um, we, our 2110C is currently paying for um, the difference between what was in our initial contract, contract with BitFocus and the fees that we're being charged now. So we are proposing to increase the fees so the agencies can help supplement those costs a little bit. The new fee structure would be $750 annually for agencies with one to five active users. Um, for six to 24 users, it would be $2,750 annually. And agencies with 25 or more users would be $3,500 annually. The rest of the policy would not change. So um, the requirement is still applicable to agencies that are receiving funding that requires HMIS participation. If an agency does not receive funding that requires HMIS participation, they will not have to pay that fee. Um, so that's the main change there. We did also add an, uh, a fee specific to coordinated entry access points. So if, um, if your agency is required to participate in HMIS, this would be in addition to that um, fee I just mentioned. If the agency is not required to participate in HMIS, this would be the only fee. And it is a flat $200 fee annually for coordinated entry access points. The next policy change um, on the same page is related to agency administrators. Um, agencies will be allowed up to two active agency administrators at a time. And agencies with over 700 active enrollments are allowed an additional agency administrator. Um, if an agency needs more than that, they are welcome to it, but they will have to um, pay the user fee costs associated with that license. The next um, change to the participating agency requirements, this is more of I guess a technicality because the requirement was already in place, but we just included it in writing in the policies and procedures. Um, the requirement that agencies participating in HMIS are participating in the data quality report cards, and then agencies with applicable project types are included in the project performance reports that are published on a monthly basis. Um, and in relation to the project performance reports, we also have developed a project performance overview document, which is this and will also be published. So what this document is, is um, it provides an overview for the project performance reports for each project type. 
So the first section has the reporting period for the different reports and when they will be shared at the data meeting. Um, and then after that, it goes into the specific measures that are included for each project type. So when this is published, um, users can review this or this document so that they can see what the thresholds are and how the measures are being calculated. So for example, for entries from homelessness, the client should be entering from one of these locations in order to be considered an entry from homelessness. Um, clients entering from these locations are considered neutral entries, so they're excluded from the measurement, um, and so on and so forth. So you'll be able to understand the project performance reports a little better, and it should help you with your review of the project performance reports. So this document <coughs> is mostly existing measures um, that we are already including data on, but it includes the thresholds and, and more details on how we're doing that. But then at the end of the document, there are four new measures, which we discussed at a previous data meeting, and they are specific to the coordinated entry system. Um, so the first is the percentage of referrals that were received from the coordinated entry system. The second is um, limiting the number of referrals that an agency denies from the coordinated entry system, how quickly matches are being accepted from the coordinated entry system, and successful matches to a housing provider. So these we have not started pulling data on yet, um, but if this document is approved along with the policies and procedures, we will start incorporating these measures in the future. Right now, these, these measures are targeting housing providers in the coordinated entry system. In the future, we will also be adding measures specific to access points in the coordinated entry system. Does anybody have <coughs> questions or comments on this, this form, the project overview form? All right, and then um, I have a question. Sure. I'm going to get to the unmute button. Um, can I see that last document again? Um, I really like that schedule. Did you say that you're going to be publishing this schedule? Yes. Yeah, so this this document is going to be published soon, and it'll be available on our website. Great. Um, yeah, most of this information is is standard and already in, in place. It's just those four new measures. Thank you. All right, and then the two more changes to the uh, participating agency requirements section. Um, we incorporated the minim minimum participation requirements for HMIS usage. These were previously discussed at a data meeting and approved by this group. Um, so hopefully these aren't a surprise to you, but they have uh, been officially added to the policies and procedures. And the last change, is um, what happens if an agency is not in compliance with the participating agency requirements. Um, this has also been discussed in a previous meeting, but if an agency is not meeting the above guidelines, um, we will discuss with the agency access working group um, whether or not the agency should continue participating in HMIS. Um, we hope not to use that, but we should have something in place in case it occurs. Um, any questions, comments, feedback on the changes to the participating agency requirements? All right. The next section with changes, um, these changes are fairly minimal, but we updated the HMIS user requirements section to include training requirements for um, the different types of access roles. So um, we added section B here, which is for read-only users. 
So these are users that have access to log into HMIS, but they can't necessarily complete any data entry. Um, and so these users only need to complete the HMIS part one training. And then we added another section for users that are requesting coordinated entry access um, and, and noting that in addition to part one and part two, they have to complete the coordinated entry training. The next section, the next section with up, updates is the technical standards section. First, um, in, in sections B and C, we just kind of um, updated and simplified the technical standard requirements from BitFocus to make them a little more user-friendly um, and streamlined. In section D, we have a requirement that um, computer screens mu must lock after five minutes of activity, and that is, um, that's not new, and that's something that we look at during our audits. But what we added was that if a user is getting up to leave their desk or whatever, and they're not using their screen, they should be manually locking their screen. And we included instructions for Windows, mobile devices, and Mac computers on how they can easily lock their screen. And then the last change to the technical standards section was we used to have a requirement that each user that accesses HMIS um, needs to have their own login on the device. So not necessarily their HMIS login, but um, like a Windows login or whatever the case may be. We removed that requirement because it was not included in the HUD technical standards for HMIS. And um, especially with the number of users that are now using mobile devices, that's not necessarily possible to do. So we remove that requirement. Any comments or questions on the technical standards section? Right. <clears throat> the next section with updates is the privacy section. The first change is that um, currently in Clarity, it is set up so that if a user does not log into HMIS for six months, they will um, be locked out of Clarity. Um, and then they'll have to complete the trainings again in order to regain access to HMIS. Um, the new change is that it will be two months of inactivity and clarity. And the reason is six months is just a really long time to have an HMIS account and not use it, especially with the cost associated with um, paying for that account and keeping it active. Um, and we would like to limit HMIS usage to users who are actively using it and um, enhancing the system. Um, the next change is in the HMIS vendor section. We updated and simplified this section to include the um, backup structure for our HMIS vendor, which is BitFocus. Um, so we incorporated their, their procedures um, into this document. The next change um, is in regards to the client consent forms. So as you all know, um, in order for a client's data to be shared in HMIS with other agencies, the client has to um, consent to sharing their data in HMIS. Um, so if the agency's first interaction with the client is uh, over the phone or otherwise not in person, 
the agency can collect verbal consent from the client to share their data. However, um, once you meet with the, the client in person, you do need to collect a signed copy of the client consent form in order to continue sharing that client's data in HMIS. And um, in addition, um, a copy of the consent form um, needs to be included in HMIS is partic particularly useful for coordinated entry. And so that will have to be collected either by um, completing an electronic signature, which is um, functionality that currently exists in Clarity. So you can have them sign it um, with the mouse on your computer or with their finger if you're using a tablet or mobile device. Or if they sign a paper form, you will have to create a PDF copy of that and upload it into HMIS. And the last change to the privacy section is um, in relation to client record requests. So it has always been true that clients can request a copy of their client record in HMIS, but um, we have made the process for collecting that or receiving that data a little more clear. And we have also standardized what is included um, when that request is made. So um, a client will have to go to an agency that they have worked in, with in the past. And the reason they will need to do that is so that 211 has somewhere that we can send the data. Um, since the, the, the dashboard, which I'll show you in a minute, includes their client identifying information, so it has to be password protected. So the, the client will go to that agency, the agency will submit the request to 211, and then we will pull that data and send it to them to share with the client. So the dashboard looks like this. And the reason that 211 has to pull this dashboard is because it includes um, data from, from multiple agencies or all agencies that have worked with this client in the past. And if the client has not um, consented to share their data in the past, your agency will not be able to pull everything that's on this dashboard. So first, we have the client profile information. So this is the data that's on the profile screen in HMIS. It's their um, basic demographic information. We included this because this is information that usually does not change. Um, so the client should be able to review and verify the accuracy of this data. And if there are any revisions that are needed, the agency they are working with should be able to correct this data in HMIS. The next section we included is the, the release of information. So this is whether or not a client has consented to share their data in HMIS. Since a client does have the right to revoke consent if they would like, we thought it was appropriate for them to know whether or not their data is being shared now. So this section includes the agency um, where the release of information was completed, how that information or that consent was collected, um, the dates it is applicable for, and then whether or not that data is being shared in HMIS. So permission yes means they are sharing, permission no means they are not. We also included a history of all of the enrollments the client has had in the past with any agency in HMIS. So they'll be able to see their entire history um, they won't be able to make any edits to this since this is based on enrollments entered by the agency, but they'll be able to view it. And then client documentation. So this is any documents that an agency has collected from the client and uploaded into HMIS. So again, they won't be able to necessarily edit this or remove documents, but they'll be able to see what has been uploaded on their behalf and by which agency, what the file is, and when it was um, done. Any thoughts on this dashboard or any of the other privacy stuff?
Is there anything that should be removed from this dashboard or that is not included that would be helpful? All right, everybody loves it. All right, so the next section with revisions is the data release section. And um, it's probably easiest for me to explain this to you by the data matrix. So the data release section is about requests for data that come in um, regarding HMIS data. And so in order to help 2110C answer those requests and, and the COC board kind of streamline those requests, we have made some updates to the data release matrix. Um, one of the changes, or the main change, I guess, is that we added a column for CES administrators. So CES administrators are the agencies that have been um, contracted by the CES lead to manage the coordinated entry system. Um, and so this, this matrix is including what information they can request that is automatically approved and what needs approval. Um, we also added a row to the matrix for program descriptor data, data. So program descriptor data is data regarding the agencies and projects that are in HMIS. It's not, it doesn't include any client data. Um, it includes information about the agency and projects. So agency and project name, project type, number of beds, um, the address if that's been included, that, that kind of information. And we added that because we do get a lot of requests for that type of data and we wanted to have a standardized process in place to kind of um, deal with those requests. Um, and so for coordinated entry administrators, the um, Suggestion is that they are allowed to request aggregate system level data as well as program descriptor data for um, other agencies participating in HMIS um, without having to get any COC board approval um, as well as ongoing data requests that they may have. And then if they need to request any client level data um, that would need approval, However, instead of the request having to go to the COC board for approval, um, it would be reviewed and approved by the COC manager, CES lead, and the HMIS lead. And the reason for that is to um, not slow down their process too much by having to wait every month for the COC board meeting. It can be reviewed more quickly so that they can continue with their workflow. Um, and then um, uses, for research, media release, or other public use also would need to be approved, and that would be approved by the COC board. Um, does anybody have any comments or questions about the data release policy? Or general feedback? All right, the next up is the grievance form. So this form is for clients that feel that their um, HMIS rights have been violated. Um, the client should be working with your agency directly if they have any issues with their HMIS record, but if it's something that can't be resolved, then they would, um, submit this form to us. So uh, the changes to the form were fairly minor. The first was that in addition to um, them sending us this form through the mail, they can also call the HMIS help desk and we will uh, pretty much complete this form with them on the phone to try to make it a little more accessible for them and a little, the process a little bit quicker. Um, the other 
change to this form is that we included a section for case manager or advocate contact information. This may help, it's optional, but it may help um, us get into contact with the client in order to resolve whatever the grievance is. Um, but it, it's not required if, if it's not needed for that client. Any thoughts on this form? <clears throat> All right. And then in addition to changes within the policies and procedures, we also added a couple new sections and documents. Um, we added a section on the help desk policies. Um, so the section is fairly straightforward. It includes our hours, um, responses to requests, and, and other policies around the help desk. Um, and I, and I think most of that information was in the policies and procedures before, but we just kind of consolidated and put it in one section so it's easy to find. Um, the next section we added was an agency access policy. So this policy was implemented by the board earlier this year, um, but it, we, so we added it to the policies and procedures also. But the, the biggest change to this policy is including a, an appeals process. So, so what's happening now is if an agency um, is not receiving funding that requires HMIS participation and they're not a housing provider, they have to submit an agency access application in order to utilize HMIS. And that is reviewed by a working group and then they're either accepted or denied access. So if an agency is denied access, um, we are adding an appeals process so that um, another group can review and, and determine if they should be allowed to participate. Um, we went over the project performance overview already. That's a new document. And then the last new section was regarding HMIS user access rules. So this is just outlining the different types of roles users have in HMIS and um, roles define what screens and functionality a user has access to in HMIS. So it's just giving an overview of those roles and um, defining those roles also helps with the, the requirements for the users that I mentioned earlier and what trainings they need to complete. Any questions or comments or feedback on these? All right. We're probably gonna end early today, guys. Um, if you haven't already and you joined late, please add your agency name to the chat box so we know who is participating. Um, so now I'm going to go over the transitional housing project performance reports. So um, like I mentioned earlier, for the policies and procedures, we will send out the draft um, over email so that you are able to review um, the whole document if you like, or um, if you want to just review the sections that I just went over that have changed, um, you can do that also but we do recommend reviewing it um, and providing any feedback since these policies uh, will affect your agencies. And um, we are planning for the policies and procedures to be shared with the policies, procedures and standards committee in January. And then it will likely go to the COC board for approval in either January or February. So, um, please review that document and provide that feedback and we'll provide a deadline for feedback and uh, where to send your comments. All right, project performance reports. So um, this month we pulled data for transitional housing projects. 
as usual. You can see the breakdown for each project that is a transitional housing project in HMIS and how they scored on each of our measures. Um, so I'll, I'll let you all look over that at your leisure. And then I wanted to go over the goals and outcomes report for transitional housing. So you can see how the, the transitional housing project type as a whole is performing. So first, um, you can see for each measure how we've been doing over the past couple years um, for transitional housing projects. To me, um, goals one, two, and five, these first three are kind of showing the impact of the pandemic on transitional housing projects. Um, Cause you can see over time, um, the entries from homelessness has gone down a bit. Um, this is because most of the transitional housing projects in HMIS do not receive any federal funding. So they're, they're, since their funding is more flexible, their requirements are more flexible. So they don't necessarily have to take um, clients from homelessness into their projects. Um, and so I've, it seems like agencies have been, have been a little more lenient in their entries in order to accommodate people during the pandemic. You can also see in the next goal, the length of stay of clients has gone up. Again, this could be related to the pandemic, um, not wanting to exit clients back to homelessness or an otherwise unsafe situation. So clients are staying longer. And then goal five is looking at utilization of transitional housing units. And this has also gone down, um, likely because some transitional housing projects had to decrease their capacity in order to accommodate um, social distancing requirements. And um, in some cases, projects have experienced a lower number of clients that want to participate because of um, COVID and, and they're concerned about you know, being around other people. Transitional housing projects have consistently done well in um, income measures. So goal six is looking at clients that increased their income while enrolled in the project. So you can see for the past four years, we have met our threshold of 12%, which is great. Um, and then goal seven is clients who increased their income by the time they exited the project. And again, the, the past four times we pulled this report, we have met the threshold for those, uh, for that as well. Um, because of that, I would recommend increasing goal six from 12% to 15 and goal seven from 35% to 38%. Um, does the group have any feedback on those or is everyone comfortable with that? I have a question. Sure. So um, I know that we're looking at uh, the county or you know all of the programs goals and outcomes, but when you look at the first report, like of all the transitional housing programs, I noticed that some for goal six, the, the data is included and some aren't. So if we're proposing to change or to increase goal six to be 18% versus 12%, um, I just want to know why some of our data is showing and some of ours isn't. So for um, goal six, the number of clients that are included in that measure are limited to those that have been enrolled and are still active in the project after a year. Um, the reason is because, so this is specific, stayers are clients that have not exited the project. And um, the measure is looking at of those stayers, are, has their income increased? And they give the clients a year in order to give the agency time to kind of work with the client to increase that income. Um, but that also means that there's very few projects 
that are included in the measure because clients are transitioning in and out of the project um, and may have not been there a year yet. Thank you. Hi, Erin, it's Stephanie at SPIN. Hi. When you are considering raising income levels, I would just caution any type of project that we are going to start raising income levels given what the state of our economy is and that we are in pandemic mode. I see that in this, you know, they had made that measure over a course of four years, which is awesome. But um, you know, this always leads to seems like kind of trickles over into other types of projects. And I would just caution that given the unstable state of our economy and we're still in pandemic mode, not knowing when that's really going to end. That's it, thanks. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, does any, does that make sense to everybody? Should we postpone increasing this threshold until maybe the next time, another six months or a year when we look at this again? And feel free to um, type in the chat too if you can't unmute. I'm looking to see if there are transitional housing projects on the call. <laughs> uh, families forward, Rose, Rosalinda, what do you think? We're not federally funded and we're pretty, um, we, we try to stick to literally homeless families, but recently we've started to do some work with refugee families um, and they don't have a lot of information when we first get in, but we're allowing them to stay in our interim housing. Uh, so I think that's affecting our data, but we have the ability to do that because we're not federally funded, it's privately funded. So I don't want to, you know, for anyone that's kind of hamstring to funding sources, I don't want to dictate what, what they feel comfortable with. Um, but it's obviously some goals that we do work towards. Okay. Um, Adriana, did you have any thoughts since, since you have projects that fall into this project type also? Um, taking the feedback that was shared, you know, I definitely agree that the state that we're in uh, right now um, makes it difficult to have fair numbers. Um, and we're also not federally funded, uh, like, like Rose said, so I, I also wouldn't want to dictate that, but um, it's just sounding overall like the tone is maybe we should hold off and see until we stabilize a little bit more um, if we should adjust these goals. Okay. All right, we'll, we'll hold off a little bit longer on these. Um, I just want this pandemic to be over. <laughs> um, don't we all? <laughs> uh, we're all doing our best. Um, all right, so the next measure is uh, goal eight. So this is exits to successful housing situations. Um, this measure has fair, stayed fairly consistent, but there has been a, a casual decline um, in exits to permanent housing situations. Um, and then for goal 10, you can see that we are consistently meeting that threshold also, um, which is great. Um, so this is looking at clients that return to the homeless system after they've been placed in a permanent housing destination. Um, so only 7% of those clients are returning to the homeless system, which is great. All right, so going into a little more detail on each, each of these measures, you can see um, across the top, we have different subpopulations that are participating in transitional housing projects and how they are doing on each measure, as well as the overall project score. So this time, 63% um, of clients are entering from homeless situations. Um, and you can see 
the, the veteran number is pretty small. So um, it's maybe a, a little more variance in that. But um, chronically homeless clients are entering from homeless situations. Um, households with children are doing a little bit better on entries from homelessness than households without children. Um, and then households with only children are fairly low at 9%. And, but the reason for that is um, there are some RIE funded transitional housing projects and those projects uh, do not require clients to be entering from homelessness. They're targeting clients that are runaway youth. Um, so that, that's why that number is a little bit lower. And that's my cat. Um, so for um, the clients that are not entering from homeless situations, you can see where they're coming from here. Um, about half are entering from institutional settings. So um, that can be hospitals, jails, um, foster care, that kind of thing. And then the, the next largest group are family and friends. Next measure is looking at the length of stay in transitional housing projects. Um, so again, this, this is looking at the number of days the clients are staying in the project. So you can see across each population type, how long they're staying. Um, households with children tend to stay in transitional housing projects longer than households without children. Um, and in our little bar chart here, you can see how long uh, clients are staying in transitional housing projects. So over half are currently meeting our threshold of 180 days or less. And then um, of the remaining clients, about half are staying 181 days to 365 days. And then the other half are staying more than a year. Okay, next goal is looking at um, the percent of units that are being utilized um, in transitional housing projects. The, the percentages are fairly consistent across different pro, um, household types, but households with children are, um, have a little bit higher of utilization. And this is likely because in transitional housing projects, a family will get their own unit together. And so they don't have to worry about social distancing necessarily because they have their own space. Whereas for households without children, um, they may have clients or two unrelated clients sharing a room and that may be lowering their utilization. In the bar chart, you can see um, how projects are performing in the utilization category. Um, most are under the 65% threshold, which is unfortunate, but not unexpected due to the pandemic. Um, and then 13 are in the, the range for utilization, so 65% to 105%, and only one is over. Um, and usually if utilization is over 105%, um, that could mean that the agency needs to adjust the um, utilization or the inventory data that they have reported to us. Um, or it could also be data needs to be corrected for the um, household types for some of their clients. Like for example, you exited the head of household, but um, a child didn't get exited. So they're still enrolled. Um, that could also cause high utilization. Goal six is stayers in the project that have increased income. Uh, again, we don't have a ton of data for this measure because clients have to be enrolled at least a year in order to be included. But for those clients that were included, um, over 75% either maintained or increased their income, which is great. Um, only 18% had a de decrease in income. And then looking at increased income for those that exited the project, we have a lot more data because there are clients that are frequently exiting transitional housing projects. Um, 
And you can see here almost three quarters of the clients either increase their income or maintain their income. Um, there was a larger percentage of clients that had no income reported. And so I just wanted to remind everyone to um, make sure you are reviewing the data that's on the exit screen before you exit clients. So as many of you know, data on the exit screen will pull over from the entry screen and then your users just have to review that data and um, make any changes before they exit. And so it's possible users are um, not carefully reviewing that income part and they're, so they're just kind of accepting whatever was entered to entry. So um, they may not be capturing that change in income that you're achieving with your clients. Um, any questions or comments on those two measures? Um, Adriana, did you have something or are you just unmuted? Because Oh, I didn't realize I'm unmuted. I'm so sorry. No worries. <laughs> no worries. I just um, wanted to make sure. Um, goal eight. Exits to success, successful housing situations. Um, so this is looking at clients that exited transitional housing to a permanent housing project. Um, again, there's a little bit of variance by the different subpopulations. Um, you can see households with children are, are doing a lot better than households without children in terms of exiting the permanent housing situations. Um, chronically homeless clients also are, are exiting to permanent housing at lower rates. Um, and that could be due to the number of resources that are available to households with children um, versus households without children. Um, it could also be due to clients um, disappearing that are chronically homeless or households without children. So if you look at the bar chart, um, this, this is showing for clients that do not exit to permanent housing situations, where are they exiting to? So 78 of those are missing. Um, so those could be disproportionately associated with households without children or chronically homeless clients. So that could be bringing their numbers down. Um, but other locations that clients are exiting to are homeless situations um, with has the most at 121 followed by temporary situations. So that um, can include other transitional housing projects. Um, it can also include, I'm trying to think of an example that's not an institution. <laughs> Um, like a residential halfway house, um, locations like that, that are, that are temp temp temporary, but not permanent. And then institutional settings would be like hospitals, um, jail, that kind of stuff. Um, all right. And then our last measure is looking at clients that exit to permanent housing that later fall back into homelessness. So um, households with children tend to return to homelessness at higher rates than households without children, which is kind of interesting and opposite than the other measures we've been seeing. Um, but otherwise, the the other measures are fairly close to the project type score, except for veterans, but that's a pretty small um, number of clients included. So there's gonna be a little more variance there. And you can see for those that are returning to the homeless system, where they are returning to, um, most, the majority are returning to rapid rehousing, um, followed by street outreach projects. And, um, I think I've mentioned this in a previous meeting, but um, it is allowable for clients in transitional housing projects to 
um, transition to a rapid rehousing project. But um, if your agency is doing this, I recommend looking at the returns to homelessness data that we send when we send the draft data on this, because um, if a client is transitioning from your transitional housing project to rapid rehousing, the exit date of your transitional housing enrollment and the start date of your rapid rehousing enrollment, um, it's possible they should even be enrolled at the same time or it should be right after the exit to, from transitional housing. Um, if there's more than a 14 day gap between the transitional housing and the rapid rehousing, that is what counts as a return. If they were to exit transitional housing and move to rapid rehousing um, like the next day, that's not considered a return. So if your agency is doing that, um, just look at that returns data because that'll tell you um, which clients were at your agency when they left your project and when they enrolled in the new project and what that project was in the project type. Um, so you can figure out if the dates that you have in there are correct, um, just to make sure you're, you're getting credit for the work that you're doing. Um, and then the last little bar chart for this is looking at, for those clients that do return to homelessness, when is that happening? Um, a little over half are returning within six months. So they're exiting the permanent housing within six months, they're back in the homeless system. Um, and then six, to, six months to one year later, um, most of the rest of the clients return. And then there are very few returns that happen between one and two years after they exit the project. So it's, it's the initial, it's the first year after that exit to permanent housing where the, the clients are most at risk of returning to homelessness. Um, and that is all I have on the project performance reports. Does anybody have any questions, comments, or feedback? I have a question. Sure. So for transitional housing, uh, you had said, you know, if you're, if they are transitioning them to their rapid rehousing project, if the rapid rehousing project is federally funded and you're taking clients into your rapid rehousing project, don't, don't you have to verify their literally homeless status before they entered the transitional housing project? for them to be considered eligible for a federally funded rapid rehousing program as only taking literally homeless clients and those from emergency shelters? Um, yes, you should be. We did also receive guidance that um, for federally funded projects, transitional housing should only be used as a temporary placement if if they're like not putting any project requirements on the client and it's mostly just a place for the client to stay while they wait for the rapid rehousing unit to be available. As long as they were literally homeless prior to entering, whether it was temporary or transitional housing project. Right, yeah. Okay, that seemed to be kind of unclear to some of us, at least to me. So perfect, that's good to know, thank you. Sure. Any other comments, questions, feedback? All right. Um, if you haven't already, please put your agency name into the chat box so we know who is participating. As usual, we will send out the meeting minutes and recording from this meeting to the users um, probably early next week. The next meeting is scheduled for January 13th at 1.30. It will also be a Zoom meeting. And um, thank you guys so much for attending and um, have a great holiday. And we will talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Erin. Happy holidays to all. Thank you. Thank you.